Good morning, good afternoon, church. Today we are going to talk about the topic of family discipleship. Before we start, let us pray. Oh Lord, we want to ask that your Spirit lead us as we listen to your Word. We pray for clarity of thoughts and obedient hearts seeking to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's imagine that we are going to start putting a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle together. This jigsaw puzzle is very complicated by the colours and designs on the pieces. It is going to be a very challenging puzzle. Let's say that all the borders of the pieces have been removed, so we have to decide the boundaries of the puzzle. Then, somebody throws in a handful of pieces from a different puzzle into this box. The size and shape of the pieces of what this person throws in are exactly the same as the original puzzle in the box. To add to this, the cover of the box is lost. So, we would not have a clear picture of what we are trying to put together. How would we respond? in doing this puzzle. This is what raising children is like. Putting the pieces of the puzzle together with our own picture in mind often does not resemble what we think we are creating as the children grow older. Discipling our children can oftentimes feel this way. The word family discipleship is not found in the Bible. In order to unpack these two words so that we can better grasp this definition, Ben Phillips succinctly defines it as a father and mother intentionally investing in their children's spiritual growth by utilising the Bible and prayer to teach the gospel through faith interactions during the family's normal daily life. When the word parent father or mother is used in today's sermon, it is applicable to adult figures that have an influence in a child's life. So whether you are married or single or have children of your own or not, let us look to the Bible about discipling the family. If we do not disciple our children as God intended, the world will disciple them. God calls His people to rise up in faith and impact others. We see this in Genesis chapter 12, when God promised Abraham that he would be a blessing to all families on the earth. The purpose of blessing Abraham's family is that he will bless others. This blessing is not for him to keep. However, as we track Abraham's life, it seemed hopeless for 25 years in order for God to fulfill His promise. God provided encouragement to Abraham in Genesis 17 by the birth of Isaac. In Genesis 18 verse 19, God provided Abraham with a vision of multi-generational discipleship impacting generations. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. The direction for family discipleship becomes clearer in this passage. When Jacob or Israel's children went into Egypt, there were 70 people. In Exodus 38, 26, it was written that more than 600,000 men aged 20 years onwards were recorded when the tabernacle of God was built in the wilderness. Bible scholars estimate the population of Israel when they left Egypt to be about 2 million. When the nation of Israel was in the wilderness, God provided Moses the laws to govern this huge nation. And in that law, the creed, the Shema, was given. One of the key texts on family discipleship is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to 9. This text is known as the Shema because the first word 
in Hebrew in the text means hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you arise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Parents must first grasp an understanding of who God is and grow in a loving relationship with God. The commands given by God must be understood, embraced and applied by parents in their own personal life before they can pass these truths to the next generation in a relevant way. The word here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 does not mean to just listen or I hear the words you are saying. It encompasses the ability to understand in any relationship, the ability for the parties to hear one another is important. Not just what is said, but what is unsaid. In this declaration, the word here focuses our attention on the next sentence, which is, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It is an interesting declaration. In this journey of discipleship, we need to understand the unity that God has. God is calling us into His unity. This unity that God has is one that is complete, one that is whole, one that is intact. Unless we understand His unity, we are unable to understand His command. This unity that God declares and exhibits, He also desires in our families to have united families, that others may see this unity, that the presence of the invisible God is displayed in the lives of those He calls. The unity of families then expands to the kingdom of God, which is the church. This is so marvellously put in this simple sentence for us to understand and follow. Parents, it starts with your walk with God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 reads, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The word heart in Hebrew means everything inside of you or the inner man. And the word soul in Hebrew is the living being, desire, passion, appetite or emotion. Some Bible scholars write that the soul is the physical substance that beings are embodied in when God created them. Personally, I won't debate and draw a distinction between heart and soul, but what I can see is the command to love God intensely with our total self. The word might is interesting as the original Hebrew word is muchness or abundance. It is like saying that we are to love God with everything we are, and then much more than that. It does sound above and beyond being intensely in love with God. When these commands are upon our hearts, we consider different aspects of it and continually think about it. Have you ever had an issue that preoccupies your mind? I remember when I was diagnosed with being pre-diabetic about two years ago. And uh, this issue was always on my mind, even when I was doing other things like spending time with the family, working or eating. It was constantly in my thoughts and what I can do to help myself. It was like I was meditating on it. God wants us to have these words that He commands to be upon our hearts. Whatever we hold in our hearts will come out in our words and actions. What we hold in our hearts impacts our thoughts. 
What are we holding constantly in our own hearts? When there is no relationship with God, there can never be effective discipleship within the family. How then is your relationship with God? Would you remember your devotional thoughts two or three days ago? How have you communicated these thoughts to your child? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 tells us to impress the command of loving God to our children. Moses commands parents to convey these commands throughout the natural rhythms of a normal day. Our relationship with God needs to infiltrate every feature of our life. Parents should know God's commands and walk with God in a way that is in a natural flow of the relationship. They will then be able to engage in faith interactions with their children during the normal routines of life, like eating, walking, or traveling. The book of Psalms has a lot of encouragement about discipleship in the family. Psalm chapter 78, verse 1 to 8, shares about the importance of telling the next generation the praiseworthy deeds that God of God and will know God so that um, people will not repeat the mistakes of past generations. Verses 5 to 8 reads, He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commands our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise to tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a gener generation whose hearts was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. In Psalm chapter 145, verse 4, David writes, One generation shall command your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. David had experienced God's works in his own life. Part of the discipling journey is to share our stories to our children of God at work in the past. These stories will help to build their faith, and they in turn learn how to see God work in their own life and tell their own stories about God. The book of Proverbs contains the most practical application and wisdom for family discipleship. It is a book written by a father sharing wisdom to his son. Proverbs also contains references to mothers, which illustrate the importance of mothers in family discipleship. It is truly a team effort involving fathers and mothers. Perhaps the most familiar passage quoted in Proverbs for family discipleship is in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train, a ch train up a child in a way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Parents are to impart the fear of God into the lives of their children so that they will walk in the path of vis wisdom and avoid the path of folly. In the book of Exodus, we see the Israelites growing in their faith as they share stories of God's work, delivering them from slavery in Egypt as they share this with their children. Exodus chapter 12, verse 26 to 27 is the instruction Moses gave to the Israelites regarding the observing of the Passover and the process of teaching the children during the observation. Okay, verse 26, yeah. and when the, your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. Family discipleship is refined as parents repetitiously teach God's word in the past that impacts their lives. This is done through rituals and ceremonies that the Israelites intentionally placed in their own calendar of events. Some families pray together every night. Some families meet weekly 
to talk about their devotional lives. And some families go on mission trips annually together. What are your family rituals and ceremonies? The family my wife and I grew up in did not have the concept of family discipleship. After Felice and I were married and had kids, we would read to them Bible stories and at times act out the stories together. When my children were young and each not five years old yet, they decided to accept Christ into their lives personally. I guess this was one of the first few steps to build a commitment to follow Christ. When the kids were older and able to read, we used to meet weekly and read a Bible passage together. As they grew older, it was very difficult to keep on doing this. Each one of them had their own schedules and wanting to weave, weave Bible truths at designated times was very difficult. As teenagers, the kids will want to engage more only if they feel like it. My wife is really good at that, engaging them, especially during the nights when I am ready to sleep. She would engage them if they want to. Felice will be able to find the time to connect deeper into their lives during those conversations and bring about certain biblical truths and principles. Now we are trying to get the whole family together at least once a week to discuss about the agreed chapter in the Bible and we would read and how we can apply these truths into our lives. It has been a really difficult journey to get everyone together during dinner nowadays. So we make do with the family members that do join us. I think that the key to family discipleship is that first and foremost, both parents must be having an intimate relationship with God daily and living out biblical truths. These can be talked with the children through the natural rhythm of life and the principles of the Bible can be brought into these conversations. We see the Pharisees practicing Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8 by tying God's commands as symbols on the hands and foreheads in little boxes. These little boxes with scriptures in them were called, called phylacteries. Jesus condemned the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 5, saying, Everything they, which is the Pharisees, do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries white and the tassels on their garments long. The Pharisees wanted to impress others, so they made their phylacteries really huge in order that people could see how much scripture they had in there. What is really important is that we keep these scriptures in the front of our minds all the time. Wherever we go, whatever we do, His words should be on our minds. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 9 goes deeper than the home decorations using God's word. His word should dominate the rules and regulations of our homes and be the guide for how we communicate and relate to one another in our homes. In the book of Acts, there are three stories of how fathers. Cornelius, the Philippian jailer, and Crispus. Okay, these three fathers were transformed by the gospel message, resulting in their whole household coming to faith in Christ. The influence of a father's salvation and the proclamation of the gospel can transform entire families. The importance of mothers is also mentioned in scriptures. Paul writes to Timothy about this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 and chapter 3, verse 14 to 17 about the role of Timothy's mother, Eunice, and grandmother, Louis, in exposing Timothy to the Holy Scriptures since infancy. It is never too early to let the next generation know Scriptures. When children see biblical truths lived out at home on a daily basis, they become convinced as they grow up. As parents share gospel truths in their lives with their family, 
the children will learn to put their trust in Jesus. Fathers and mothers have different God-given roles in discipling their children. Fathers are cautioned against provoking children to anger. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says this, where fathers are commanded to bring them, the children, up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The Christian home is really an important environment where the passing of the faith occurs from one generation to the next. This faith that is nurtured in the home can be multiplied outside of the home until every tribe, tongue and nation have heard the good news. We talk about the principles of family discipleship, but in reality, we all struggle. I would like to provide just three examples from the Bible of the challenges of passing down these important values to the next generation. In the book of Genesis, we read that God commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and to multiply. God did this by institutionalizing marriage for the multiplication of mankind and the spiritual formation of the next generation. We can observe that family discipleship was not ideal as we see the outcome of the first family. We see that Abel brought a sacrifice that was pleasing to God and Cain did not. Cain was jealous of Abel and killed him. All families struggle with sin and imperfection since the fall. We also see in Genesis chapter 13, verse 8 to 13, where Abraham and Lot separated because God has blessed them tremendously. Lot chose to stay in a city called Sodom. In Genesis chapter 19, we see that two angels went to Sodom to bring Lot and his family away from this wicked city. Notice Lot's response in Genesis chapter 19, verse 8, when the men of Sodom demanded that Lot bring these two angels so that they could have sexual intercourse with them. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. From Lot's response, we learn that we respond in stressful situations with the values we build within ourselves over the years. We also see in verses 30 to 38 how Lot's daughters had sexual intercourse with Lot in order to preserve their family line instead of looking to God for direction. Lot and his two daughters may have escaped Sodom, but Sodom continued to live within them. In the book of Judges, a generation was raised that did not know the Lord because families had failed to disciple their children. This was a tumultuous time as people did what they believed was right without any reference to God at all and the consequences reaped were awful. All through Israel's leadership and eventually until Israel's exile, the nation flourished under godly leadership and failed under ungodly leaders. Children need to have their very own personal encounter with God. We read in Joshua chapter 3 that after Moses died, Joshua led Israel to, into the Promised Land across the Jordan River. Joshua stressed the importance of passing on the stories of one's faith to the next generation. The crossing of the Jordan River became another story that would be retold about God stopping the waters of the Jordan River from flowing and enabling the Israelites to walk across on dry ground. A new generation of Israelites would have a fresh encounter with God. This would be their story as they remember their fathers telling them of how God parted the Red Sea while escaping from Egypt at the back of their minds. A 12-stone memorial was erected to prom their children to question their parents, to share the story of God's miraculous work. The book of Joshua concludes with Joshua challenging the Israelites who they would serve. Joshua proclaimed that he and his family would serve the Lord. 
The question now is that do we have our own memorials to prompt our children to question us? Are our children encountering God in a fresh way and not depend on our stories of encountering God? Despite the failings of men, God's heart is for the family to be God's beacon in this world and represent Him. We see the Old Testament beginning with the emphasis on marriage, but humanity's fallen nature quickly created catastrophic results. The Old Testament ends with an emphasis on marriage and family, reflecting God's true desire that we reflect His nature in unity within the family. God promises restoration to families if we respond to Him. This is seen in Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. Did He not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. God desires that the family exhibits His oneness and faithfulness. God desires that godly offspring be a product of this union and that we guard ourselves in our own spirit to remain faithful. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, it says, And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. A beautiful picture of restoration in the family is painted here. If this is not done, impending judgment of total destruction will be carried out. For parents that have children who are working closely with God, there is much to rejoice. Continue your efforts and labour in discipling them. The third letter of John 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. For parents who have yet to intentionally engage in the plan of discipling your children, I would like to encourage you to do so. And for many parents who are struggling, the passage from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 16 to 17 says, Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping, and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. The book of Jeremiah is written to the Israelites exiled in Babylon because of their pagan worship. The context of this passage is a poetic picture about Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more, and Rachel refuses to be comforted. But God commanded comfort to the one who refuses to be comforted because there would be a reward and a restoration. Her children will return from the land of captivity. God's promise of restoration means that there is hope in your future. Wherever you are wrestling with this issue, whatever setbacks you are encountering, believe in God's restorative purpose for your family. Families have the best opportunity to disciple their children because of the amount of time they can spend with them. However, discipleship need not be limited to the home. A true picture of family discipleship leads the family and its members to fulfil the Great Commission through exercising kingdom values first at home, then the church, the community, community and then the world. In conclusion, parents must have a growing daily relationship with God and be empowered to understand and apply God's Word. Through the overflow of their relationship with God and time spent with God's Word, parents can disciple their children by sharing God's Word to the natural events of the day. Children who are well discipled will impact the lives of others by bringing glory to God at home. To others, 
and the generations to come. Let us pray. Our God, our Father, we want to thank you for giving us families. We pray, Lord, that you will deepen our desire, our creativity, our intentionality to disciple the children you have given us. May our children respond to the call of discipleship and choose to follow you wholeheartedly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.